Ja, ja, hej. Hej. Slut. Okej. Okay, thank you. So uh, what I will talk about today is the network uh, network control systems, uh, and uh, the reason is, of course, that I'm uh, sitting in the systems and control group here at Chalmers. I recognize a few of you from the autonomous twisted project here uh, that I'm sort of in charge of. Uh, but uh, I would like to start by saying a few things uh, about what are the current trends going on uh, that people talk about. Uh, so there are a couple of buzzwords here that are mentioned everywhere. So cyber physical systems, uh, industry 4.0, it's a German initiative mainly focus on the manufacturing sector and then you have the in industrial internet of things but what I would say that all these three different buzzwords have in common is that they focus on three different aspects the three C's so it's the computation it's the control and it's the communication and now you study communication here and Basically, the communication here is an uh, enabling technology, right? Because now suddenly we can have thousands of sensors that uh, collect a lot of different information. And then, with the use of computation, you can do a lot of filtering on these. So you have signal processing problems to solve. Uh, you have sensor fusion problems. They will sense different parts of the system, and then you would and they will see, yeah, they will see different parts, and then you try to merge it into one estimate of what is the current state of the system. And when you have a good state of the system, you would like that typically to do control. So if you build an autonomous car, then you have to make decisions. Where should we go, for example? Uh, and the more data you can collect, the better decisions you can make. Uh, so in this sense, communication is really important here. So it's, it's an, that's why I said it's an, an enabler, that that has really changed things. So just to give you an overview of what it can look like. So, so we have a plant to be controlled. So this could be a car or it can be a huge uh, um, power plant or, or, or um, a factory. And Connected to that plant, then you have a diff lot of different sensors and you have a lot of different actuators. So, for example, motors uh, controlling the, the vehicle if it's a car. And then you hook this up, all these sensors and actuators, they, you hook them up to uh, one or several different networks. And then you have different control algorithms running uh, here and it could be one or many different controllers. So we will look a little bit about how this is this look like in in practice. So if we go to a vehicle, uh, we can see that we have so this is a network architecture. So it's a little bit different for different brands, but they essentially they are all similar to what we see here. So they have different subsystems. You have the powertrain the chassis and safety, body electronics, the head unit. Uh, and then they are then connected to external communication with GPS and uh, 4G networks, etc. Uh, but if you go into something here, for example, the brake control, that is something that is 
really critical because if you know that there is a chance for an accident, then you really need to to break or actually even now people talking about to, to actually steer the car as well away from the accident so you'll have active steering. But that is really, you need to take decisions fast, right? So you would like to be guaranteed if you send out, okay, now we need to brake, that you, the brake actually happens very, very fast after you made this decision. Um, and then you have other systems like the audio and display system. Here you typically send a lot of data, but it's not, it's not safety critical, right? But you, you would like to have a high bandwidth instead. Uh, while here you send, you don't send very much data, but you have uh, demands on that you, you, you actually would like to know that uh, the message is delivered in time. And then you have others that are in between here, so the engine control. So maybe the, there is, if, if the engine is not controlled in the right way, it, it might not be a safety problem necessarily, but it might be that it doesn't work as well as it should have done otherwise. So this is one reason why if you go into a, a vehicle today, there are a lot of different communication buses in the same vehicle. So, so it can be three or it can be five different buses. So this is some numbers I got from that is used at the BM, BMW 7 series. So they have five different buses here. So we have the multimedia bus that is using its own uh, protocol, it's called MOST. So it's based on that you have fiber communication. Uh, and then if we go to the powertrain here, you see here is uh, some version of a CAM bus. We will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and here you have the pas passive safety, which is also uh, an, another bus. Uh, but here you have very high sa safety requirements. And some of them use are using fiber connections and others are using uh, just copper cables to connect them. Uh, but you see here the difference in bandwidth. For the most you have 22 megabits and for the power uh, system you have 500 kilobits per second. Uh, so if we go to, to a truck, so we talk to a Volvo, Volvo truck for example, then it's not only five or six different communication buses. So they have between 16 and 19 different networks in a single vehicle, right? Um, and then they have uh, some other uh, lean networks, so it's an even simpler protocol. Then there is also Ethernet and Wi-Fi to do other things. And they have about 100,000 different parameters that can be turned on and off. So it's quite uh, an amazing number of uh, parameters that you have and about 22,000 external signals that are sensed and, uh, by the system. Uh, so, with this many <coughs> sensors that you might have, it's, it, of course you would like them to connect them to a communication bus, right? Because if you go back many years, you had specific wires between every sensor and every actuator and the microcontroller. But then there will be a lot of copper needed, or a lot of cabling, and it's not really reliable. So. Of course, you would like to reduce cost by having fewer wires and just connect all the, the sensors and actuators to a bus. But uh, you would also get increased reliability by having fewer contact po points. And you have a modular solution. So if you decide on having another sensor, you can just hook it up to the network. And it's easy to, if you have some other electronic control unit that would like to know the speed of the vehicle, for example, you can just read the message from the, the bus uh, to get that information. However, there are of course a couple of disadvantages as well when you connect through a bus and 
The a main reason is that uh, the bus, communication bus here, is then shared between different electronic control units and different sensors and actuators. So when, for example, a sensor would like to send a message to the electronic control, control unit, it might mean, mean that the communication bus is used by some other um, uh, message at that time. So it has to wait. So it introduces latency, which is basically a delay. So, uh, and it also introduces jitter, which is the variation in delay. So from time to time, it can take different time when it, from the time when it tries to send a message until it is received. That time will not be constant. It will change since the communication bus is, bus is shared. So this, of course, makes it complex to analyze what's going on. Uh, in the bus. And I think most of you, or maybe all of you, have taken a basic control course now. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Typically you have some control algorithm in the middle here. So expressed as a difference equation. Uh, that is in, in charge of controlling a process. And at every time step here, the control algorithm is updated, com compute some control signal that goes through a DA converter and then uh, affects the process. And then you measure the output signals and then you go through an AD converter and back and then you form uh, the control error here yeah, that is input to the control algorithm. So if you think back, what did you learn in the basic control course? Basically we assumed here that everything you could measure here was this, you had no delay for this to be measured, right? Uh, and you also assumed when you did discrete control that you had the same time between every, every sample, right? So going back now, what did we saw? We sa saw that we added delay and we added jitter. So they the time will be different every time, and uh, yeah, we will have a delay, and it will be it might be different every time. So the basic assumptions that we we had in in the basic control course doesn't necessarily hold in when you hook up uh, a controller to a computer network where you have the sensors and actuators on the network it, itself. Uh, and something else that is a bit interesting is that even though I don't think I, I didn't mention, but you, typically in a car you can have hundreds of different ECUs, and e every ECU is then running not only a single task, but it actually has a real-time operating system and is in charge of having running many different control tasks. Uh, so you do not only share the communication bus, you also share the processor which will further introduce delay and jitter. Uh, <coughs> and yeah, so, so this means that, yeah, so since the computer is shared, uh, this basic assumption that you have an infinitely fast computer does not hold either. So you have this problem, basically the same problem, both in the communication bus and on the computer. So how are you going to deal with it? And the basic answer is that it's very complicated to, to deal with it. You can, can, for example, try to measure it. So what was the delay? And compensate for that in the control algorithms. So if you, for example, did the Ballandrino assignment. This is actually what we do in, inside there. We actually me measure the sample distance and then we calculate. So we have different gains every time depending on how long it was since the last sample. Um, but, uh, but this stochasticness of the, the system ma makes it really hard to come up with, with analytical solutions. So there are some results that you can use, but pretty much you still you need to test a lot of different cases and, and assume worst case uh, scenarios and try to, to compensate for that. Because it's also if you 
remember back to the control course, if you, you know that uh, a delay is bad for the stability, so it will uh, increase the phase delay, and the phase delay is connected to the phase margin. Right? So incre increased phase delay will reduce the phase margin. So, and if you reduce the phase margin, th the system might become unstable. Right, so it's bad for uh, the performance. Uh, and in worst case, it might even become unstable. Uh, so, so there are some ways, if it's deterministic, then you can try to compensate for that. So the Otto Smith controller, for example, if you saw that. Um, uh, So, but it, it, it is uh, still a, a, a complex problem. So typically what you like to do is to schedule both when the control algorithms uh, execute and when they communicate on the communication bus. So if you know beforehand which control task you will have and when they need to communicate, then you can sort of set up so the system in such a way so that no one else will be using uh, the communication network when a certain control task would like to execute. Uh, but if we um, look at what is specific uh, for network control systems, uh, and if we now compare what is the difference for desktop computer that is hooked up to internet, for example. So, one thing and now I'm talking about the powertrain control and uh, so control of motors and airbags, etc., brakes. Uh, is that we need really efficient transmission of short data. So it's usually not a lot of data that we send. So we can measure some value or speed or something like that, but it's typically a, a few bytes. So it's not a lot of data that like a video stream, for example. Uh, and you have some tasks that are periodic. So, for example, the engine control, you have typically have short periods. and uh, You need low latency and you need small jitter. And then you have sudden uh, messages that you need to send. For example, an alarm. So now there is a chance for an accident, for example. So that, that is not something you send out periodically, but it's from time to time, right? But then you need to, to know that when you need to send this a periodic message, that it will, actually, it will actually be able to deliver the message on time. And then you have uh, non-real-time data that you need to send out as well. For example, logging parameters so that you would like just to keep. Um, for your notes. Uh, and some of the data are between point to point. You have one sender, one receiver. But it can also be that you have one sender and many receivers that listen to it. So it's a little bit different. So how is this done in the automotive industry? And, and uh, I would say that the CAN bus, the controller area network, it, it was is still the most common network, although it's uh, yeah, it's almost 40 years old. So it was developed in the mid-80s. Uh, so it's, it's used in cars, tracks, buses. Uh, there are also variants that are used in factories of it. Uh, and it has a bus topology here. So all nodes will receive all the different messages. And I think you have uh, studied Ethernet now, right? And CSMA CD protocol. Is that right? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, <coughs> but then I can just try to give you the main idea. So uh, the basic, so, so the communication bus is then shared between all these different sensors and electronic uh, control units. And if one of them would like to send, what it does it is that it will listen to the bus, 
so that no one else is sending at the si same time. Because if some node is sending, it will just wait until the bus becomes idle again. And then. Uh, but, of course, there is a chance that there are two nodes that would like to, to send, and they start to send at the same time. So, within the, CAS, within the CAM bus protocol, there is then, all the messages then have a priority. So then there will be an arbitration mechanism that will basically figure out, so the one with the highest priority will continue to send its message, and the one with the lower priority will then back off and wait until the one with the higher priority has uh, finished sending its, sending its message. So, so there is a, so the sort of the electrical structure of the bus uh, allows you to do this very efficiently. So, of course, so this is an important feature that you have in uh, a CAM bus. You have the priorities. So, for example, if you need to do an emergency brake, that will have higher priority than if, if you have something that is not safety critical. So this is different from, for example, Ethernet, where, they, if, where you don't have the different uh, priorities uh, between the different nodes. Um, so this is much more suited for, for uh, control applications. Uh, but it's an old standard, uh, so the transfer speed is, is one megabit in the original formulation at least. It, you can typically send relatively short messages, so maximum here is 8 bytes. And the bus length is not that long either, so 40 meters, but it's typically enough for vehicles. Uh, so, if we switch over to Ethernet, so in Ethernet, uh, so this is a frame in Ethernet. So you haven't seen this before, right? Done. Okay, so in Ethernet you have a destination MAC address. So that's where you, that's the MAC address. Every node in the network has a MAC address. So this is the one you're sending the message to. And this one is the, one, the address of the node that is sending it. And then there are some different Ethernet types. And then you have a data field here that is between 46 and 1500 bytes. And then you have some CSE code at the end. Uh, and you see here, so this is built to do, put a lot of data inside. So can this be used for control applications then? So there are of course a few advantages. It has high bandwidth, send a lot of data. It's a relatively low cost because it's very standardized. It's used in every computer everywhere. But it doesn't have priorities among the messages. Uh, it's typically the way the, this CS, how it's accessed the, uh, the network means that there will be high latency and jitter. So it's really not suitable for control applications. Uh, there is also a very large minimum packet size. So it means that if you need, need to send a lot of small messages, then there will be a low utilization of the bandwidth, for example. So, what happened was that there had become uh, another standard called EtherCut, which is building on the electrical interface of Ethernet, but it, it, uh, it's used in a little bit different way. So it's a master-slave architecture, meaning that there is a master here, so a controller, for example, and then you have the different I.O. modules, and they are connected with a standard Ethernet interface and an Ethernet cable to each other. Uh, and within each node here, you have a special circuit that basically what it does is that it will read the incoming, what's, com what's happening on the incoming node, and then send it to the output here that will stand connected to the next node. So this is different from how you usually connect uh, Ethernet when you have a, a switch in the middle you, uh, that everyone is connected to, connecting to. So here it's from one to one all the time. But inside the data field here, you then have different telegrams. 
So within one Ethernet frame, you can then have one telegram for each I.O. node that you have. Uh, so, so this can then be filled in by one sensor here. Uh, so if we go back here, so, so it's, let's say, so this is one sensor. So it just reads the Ethernet frame and then it figures out, was this a message for me? And if it was, then it, it will go backwards again. So when, the, when it will see the uh, Ethernet frame again, it will now fill in the value for this sensor. And in this way, you, this is much more suited for the control applications where you need to, s to be able to have uh, short delays and you need to have a lot of different I.O. points and use the bandwidth. So uh, this way it's extremely efficient. So for example here, you can have a low latency in each, each slave here. So on the order of 1.35 microseconds per slave that you have, per IU module, module that you have. So then you can have many different sensors to every IU module. But it's a very, very low latency network. And basically since uh, all the communication is initiated by the master and then the information is filled in, there will be no one else that will be using the bus so it doesn't need to have a medium access protocol at all. Um, so if you compare here, so uh, if we have 50 different I.O. models, so each slave has to be addressed individually, so that is about 50 different Ethernet frames. But with Ethernet, with Ethercut, you can then put them into one Ethernet frame and then you have 50 different telegrams instead. So meaning that you can, if you have 1,200 or 12,000 different digital IOs, you can process them within 305, 350 microseconds on a 100 megabit network with low latency and jitter. The drawback here is that all the communication has to be initiated from the master. So that's, that's what you give up by gaining these things. Uh, so to conclude, what I'm trying to, to tell you here is that the, for Control systems, the requirements are a little bit different. So we have few bytes or small data amounts. We have typically short periods. We would like to have low latency and low jitter uh, to yeah, avoid um, running into stability problems, for example. And the most well-known protocol, Ethernet and TCP IP, is not really well suited for these applications. So you, but you can make it suitable by sort of adjusting how to interpret what, what's in the data field here. So, uh, so that's why this so EtherCAT uh, is becoming quite uh, well known and, and used in many different applications as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, so we have jitter and uh, latency and jitter. So jitter is the variation in, in the delay. So I mean, at, at uh, one sampling instant, it can be the delay can be one millisecond. The second time, it can be two millisecond, and then it can be one and a half the third time. So it varies. So that makes it complicated for the control algorithm to compensate for it because if it was the same every time it would be easier. But since it's changing, it, it's, it's more complicated. Hmm? Okay. 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 I, I yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're um, welcome. Uh, if you compare today's Ethernet with the one that you had like 20 years ago, uh, has there been any sort of development in terms of uh, improvement or is it the, the same? I mean, it was invented in the 1980s yeah, so I, I'm not an expert on, on uh, Ethernet, so, uh, uh, but as far as I know, the Ethernet frames are the same. So uh, they have the same structure and the same benefits and disadvantages. So yes, there's I, I, I know that it, the size it, of it the... Is, it is used in some applications where it should be 
sort of um, possible to, to, to determine I mean, a certain, within a certain time frame. But as such, the Ethernet protocol is, is not, um, I mean... Yeah, so it has, it has no built-in mechanism to no. deal with that, at least. So, but, it still but does not have that, no. Okay. I, that's, maybe you know that better, but... So they have this quality... Uh, quality of service. Yeah, quality of service, but I think that's built yeah. on top of uh, the Ethernet frame. So, yeah. You have to ask Eric about that. <laughs> he knows everything about that. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you so mm? much. Thank you. Mm? 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 Så kan du göra. Har du här vad det är med eller? Ja, det kan. Den var min då. Ja, jag har ingen med mig. Nej. Den var nog din. Jokvis is a professor of practice in healthcare informatics at Chalmers, and he has been a pioneer in uh, e since the mid-1980s, developing solutions found in ambulances now around the world. Uh, Jokvis is also the uh, head or the program manager for the national open cooperation platform called the Hospital ICT Arena at Lindholmen, which is promoting uh, innovation and utilization of ICT and uh, e-health in pre-hospital care. Apart from this, uh, he's also responsible for the research area care and rescue at SAFER, which is the vehicle and traffic safety center at Chalmers. So uh, in this presentation, uh, Bengt will introduce uh, eHealth to us uh, and show us how communication comes to be used uh, to provide this uh, ICT application. So let's listen to him. Thank you, and um, uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the presentation. Yeah. We have a little bit of short of time, so I go start directly. This is uh, the plan for what I will be talking about. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction about what eHealth is all about, and then the drivers for eHealth and the digitization that we now see in uh, the healthcare sector. Then there will be a break, hopefully, and then we come back and we'll focus on uh, pre-hospital eHealth or health informatics, and that's something I've been dealing with for many, many years. So uh, it will not be that much about uh, communication details, merely what you can do with communication in order to solve various problems within uh, the healthcare sector. And as you will see, there is a lot of them to uh, handle in the future. So my first question, what is e-health? Has any of you any clue about that? Have you heard about it? No one? Strange. Okay, it's very much on the agenda, but the simple definition is just that it's a use of information and communication technology to improve care and promote health. But uh, as you will see now, there are a lot of different ways to interpret this uh, subject and there are very many different things involved within e-health. But for instance, we have some examples. Uh, you have a lot of electronic health records, you have what is called PACS, picture and archiving and communication systems, and a lot of information to handle in uh, the health sector, that's about e-health. We also are now going more and more into what is called computerized clinical decision support system, which includes machine learning, artificial intelligence and other ways to support decision making in the complete healthcare process, all over the processes. There's also thing about bringing care closer to the patient, that is to that we can monitor people in their own homes, do checkups in their homes. You have seen all those video applications coming up now where you can visit your primary care doctor just using your smartphone. There are also monitoring solutions where we monitor, for instance, people with congestive heart failure or chronic obstructive lung disease in their own homes. 
very much is also about improving care processes and that's m the most thing I would talk about today. Uh, that is to share information along, for instance, a care process, in this case an ambulance journey, in order to improve the care and make sure that we take the patient to the best hospital for what this patient suffers from. And there's also things like health promotion and other things. And very much now is also around the smartphones, what we can do with them, supporting people wi with mental diseases, monitoring stuff, and there's a lot of things happening there. And it's a complete area of its own. So as you stand understand, there's a lot of communication involved in this. And uh, going for the definition of what it is, I will not go all through this, but this is a way that uh, European U community have decided to describe what e-health is. And as you can see from the first line here, it's almost the same as I said. And then they give a lot of examples. And I really like what they say at the bottom here. And many other ICT-based tools assisting disease prevention, blah, blah, blah. So you can see it's anything involving anything with ICT. Of course, we also have the World Health Organization that has looked into this. And they have also a uh, definition, which we will come back to later. And it's also about e-health is the use of information and communi communication technologies for health. And they have made some statements, for instance, already in 2005, they encouraged all member states to take action to incorporate e-health into the health systems and services. Uh, they uh, recognized in 2013 the need for health data standardization to be part of e-health systems and services. This is very, very important part because if we don't ca cannot share information between different systems, we cannot do all those fancy stuff we can imagine ourselves to do. So this is one of the most important things here is standardization. And you can say that there are two things involved in this type of interoperability we are looking for. It's technical operability, that is that the systems can talk with each other technically or electrically, but also that they understand each other. There is a semantic interoperability so that we don't miss that one system says it's the right arm and the other one inter interprets it as the left arm and then we maybe do something on the wrong arm. So there are various things that we need to agree upon in order to be able to share information. And in 2016, they also noticed this thing about what is called M-Health. And that is very much including when you use your smartphones for different types of, of uh, medical or health purposes. And the thing with this is that they are becoming so non-expensive that they can be used by almost anyone, also in developing countries. And we have seen that there is a big growth in developing countries because they have a lack of medical educated personnel but usually they rather quickly build up an infrastructure for uh, mobile communication. So they can bring out health and provide better health by using the mobile networks that are established there very rapidly. So going back to more terms in this area, when I started with this some 30 years ago, we said that we were dealing with telemedicine and at that time we didn't even know that we were dealing with telemedicine. We were sending information from one place to another. But then we realized that this is telemedicine. And telemedicine is one part of e-health. But you can see it, that there are other things here as well. I mentioned M-Health. We have this thing about ambient assisted living that is very much about smart homes and things like that. And there are various other things. And one thing that is coming up now is also what we call welfare technology, because that's also to some extent part of e-health. And what is that? Well, it's technology to help elderly people or people having some types of, of uh, disabilities to live in their own homes and support them in their ordinary daily work and daily living. Digitization, or whatever we call it, is also a very important thing here because we are now entering into an era where we, we quickly change the whole healthcare sector by bringing in digital solutions to everything. This is what industry and banking did a number of years ago, but now this is entering, happening inside the healthcare sector. It doesn't go that very quick, but it's still there and it's happening right now. So this is also a very important thing to keep in mind when, when we are talking about e-health. Uh, applications. And again, as you see, there's a lot of communication, of course, involved in this. So, another question. Is there any specific e-health technology? 
How do you think? Okay. I'm not quite sure that there is, because it, it could be if you call these interoperability standards and things like that some special technology. But in my meaning, it's more like using all those technology tools that we are learning here at Chalmers in a specific context. We need to understand which tools to pick from our toolbox in order to do good solutions that support this care problem or whatever it is that we shall deal with. And one fancy thing about this is that no matter what technology gadgets you find, you can always find a way to use them here. Because as long as we improve the ICT sector and deploy new types of solutions and uh, equipment, etc., we can always use them here. But it's important first to understand the context. And what is that? Well, we need to understand the care or the medical needs that we need to support and handle. It's very, very important to understand who shall use this solution and why shall we bring in this type of technology. This is, has for too many years been very technology driven. There's a lot of happy uh, technology people that say, oh, what a nice tool I found. Can I do something in the me medicine with that? And then they start developing something and try to push that on the healthcare sector. But the thing is that we need to turn that around. It's the healthcare sector that needs to understand that they should improve their way of supporting us as patients, which we end up sooner or later. And therefore, it's so important that we really understand what this, how this should be used and why. Also, we have a lot of legislation to take care of. Some of these solutions are, are like medtech products, which means that they have to be tested almost like a, a new drug. And there are other things about patient integrity and other things. We have also ethical considerations. In many situations we deal with sick people. And some of these people are dying or are very sick. And we need to then understand what, uh, how are we really affecting their lives and what do we bring into their lives. So this is also very important to have with you when you start. For instance, in my course, eHealth, we have uh, specialists in, in ethical uh, things coming and giving two hours of presentation just on the ethical aspects of using technology in this sector. Then there are of course all these things about technology availability and things like that, costs, who shall provide the services and the benefits of course to the patient, to the healthcare provider, etc. So, why is this becoming so interesting? It's not that it's so fun to do fancy technical stuff. One of the things is that one realized this was a thing that was a study that was carried out, uh, I think, in the beginning of 2000, where they found that 44,000 people in the United States died each year in the healthcare sector. It could be 98,000, just due to mistakes. And a uh, lot of those mistakes could be avoided if we had had right information at hand when we made the decisions and if we knew more about the patients. So this is one of the things here that we want to reduce the errors in the healthcare sector. These studies have been carried out in many, many countries and unfortunately this is in Sweden, but uh, some is translated. So when they did this a couple of years from Socialstyrelsen, what that, I don't know what that's in English, uh, some governmental resource. They found that in Sweden we had around 3,000 people dying each year due to mistakes in the healthcare sector. It could be more or it could be less. But still, 3,000 people die in a way unnecessary if we had done the right stuff. And compare that with the traffic where we have a zero vision. Today, we, this year, or 2017, we had 252 54 people dying in the traffic. And I think that we should have a zero vision for healthcare. And I think that eHealth could be part of trying to solve that problem. And another thing is that the healthcare costs, we cannot cope with those way, this way that we are now providing healthcare because it costs too much. This red line here is uh, the amount of gross national product that we invest in healthcare today. And uh, if you see Sweden, we have uh, a little bit below 10%. And the upper curve here is what we estimate in 2050, or even uh, earlier, uh, as I've seen. So the costs are rising. And the reason for that is that we have a growing number of elderly, 
we become elderly in the population, we live longer, we stay of course healthier longer, but st soon or less, uh, sooner or later we will be sick. So we need to handle all those chronic diseases. And the people problem is that we have no people to handle them in the way we have done this before. So the costs are rising, there is too little people to take care of this, so we need to do something. And then we think that e-health or using ICT in a smarter way is one way of coping with this. All countries in the world almost have something they are doing in this area. So this is just some snapshots. And here in Sweden we started already in 2005 to set up a strategy for e-health. It was uh, improved in 2010. And this is just to give you an idea of what's happening around the world. It's also from World Health Organization. You can see that 58% of the member states have an e-health strategy today. 55% have changed their legislations to cope with this in a better way. And 87% are doing something on M-health. So that shows you a little bit what's happening around the world. And they are even pro uh, publishing what they call national e-health strategies so that countries can bring this in to start the setting up a vision for their e-health sector. If we look at Sweden, and this is the last thing I will do before we take a break, you can see that we, we are focusing on three different areas in our strategy. It's support for the health professionals. This has very much to do with how we deliver care and improving that. We have also what we call patient empowerment. It's as simple things as that we can book our appointment on the net using our smartphone. And there are other things to support us, that we shall have access to all our electronic patient records and stuff like that. And we have support for policymakers. That is that we can make huge statistical analysis on the care we produce in the country to make sure that we are doing the best or at least are improving. So these are the three fundamental parts there. And last year, no, it's two years now, March, almost two years ago, we set up a new vision for e-health for Sweden. And there's a very high ambition because we said that in 2025, we shall be best in the world uh, using e-health. And the important thing is to support the citizen, to make it easier for people to achieve good and equal health and welfare. So that's the reason why we should use this. And there are three concepts that they mention. It's e-health, it's the digitization, and that the welfare technology. All these are part of our vision for, for 2025. And this is run by the government in conjunction with something called the Government Office of uh, uh, Swedish Association for Local Authorities and Legacies. And uh, this is not so important, but you can see what they focus on in the working groups. It's standards, regulatories, semantics, and then follow up uh, on what they have been doing. And a very important thing here is the National Advisory Board, because I'm part of that. No, but <laughs> they're bringing in people like me in this to give some guidance on what we shall do. So next is pre-hospital health, but before that, break. <laughs>